Welcome to the show. Yeah, so, thank you for having me. Let's start with who you are and what you do. So um, Tom Carty, and I work for Texas for the state, and kind of ended up in this journey. I'm going to call it a journey. Basically, after the pandemic, you know, that little event that happened back uh, about four years ago. And um, what we found out during that time period, when we served 7 million customers in about a five-week period, and that's the equivalent of seven years worth of customers that we had served in the previous seven years, we found out the way we were operating in our customer centers, we couldn't do that. It was not sustainable. It was that pressure situation. If it was gonna break, it was gonna break. And there was no fixing it kind of situation. So we learned that we had to re-engineer, transform our customer service delivery model. And so basically I was given that little small task (laughs) to design this, get the approval process, the approval from our our state leadership and uh, go out and design and build this. And we're actually about to start the actual building of this here in a few months. So how long has the planning phase been? So because it's government, you know, we're not able to just like turn on a dime. Like our legislature, uh, it meets every two years. So I basically spent two years planning okay. and then I had a year to, you know, the, the, the year to submit my budget proposal, get the legislative approval and then get the RFO out on the street, get the bids, all that kind of stuff that we have to do for, you know, procurements. And um, so now we're just in the position where we're just now getting ready to start building this out. Wow. So exciting next two years ahead for you. Absolutely. What were your key priorities as you put this plan and strategy together to meet this new accelerated world of customer experience? The first priority, the first most important priority was that it was customer centered design. So I had to know what our customers wanted, how they were coming in to get services. The Pathways is looking at a lot of that data across our websites, phone call data, you know, email data, and looking at all of that and then interpreting that into what we needed to procure. So, you know, because so many people want to just go out and say, hey, I want a chat bot. Yeah. You know, and I was like, now we're going to do this different. We're going to really explore this and, and go, go the route of, you know, what does the customer need? So everybody wants to be customer centric. I love that you spent the time to do that. Let's contextualize for the audience how you went about that and without revealing too much or as much as you want, take us back to contextualize your perspective in the industry. Is there a difference between public and private sector, uh, customer experiences? Give us a flavor for where you are in the landscape. I would say I would say there, there is a difference between public sector and private sector. Uh, I think public sector is able to be more agile. They're able to adopt things quicker, uh, you know, things of that nature. Government, we, we, we have parameters and bookends, I'm going to call them that, that are on us that we have to kind of operate within. It's not undoable or anything like that. It's totally achievable. It just requires more planning to do it. Uh, but at the same time, I can do a lot of front-end planning so that whenever mm, I do yeah. get my authority, I can take off at a much faster pace basically so i can do things like across all of our programs all the customer journeys that we need to do looking at all that start designing how this is going to look so by the time i'm talking to vendors i can almost give them a playbook of what it's going to look like right yeah it's because the planning has to be so much more meticulous mm-hmm. not a lot of agile work i would guess i try to do agile in anything i do you know when it comes to like the technology because there's kind of two good there's two pieces to this right there's the agile, there's purchasing technology and implementing. That's kind of what I've talked about most, right? But there's also the people aspect of this and the agent side of it and your processes that are internal. That's where I can get pretty agile is on those internal processes. So we can sit there and look at our internal processes and say, okay, why am I getting a lot of phone calls about a password reset right now? What's going on? So I can, I'm looking at data. And then it could be that maybe a knowledge base article is incorrect. Maybe that chatbot's giving out incorrect information. Or maybe something is wrong with that application. And so we can go in and we can fix those things. But then we can also sit there and say, okay, wait a minute. It's taking us, we ought to be able to knock out like, you know, some sort of inquiry within a couple of days maybe. And it's taking us weeks. What's going on? Why, why is that happening? Then we go in and look at our internal processes. We've got a team that 
We use lean six sigma theory constraints. We've, so we got a team that will go in and dive into these processes and look at them. And we try to make these changes in, in weeks and not months on those kind of changes where we can do that. So in order to do that, you've got to have a good system that monitors the conversations in real time mm-hmm. so that you're, you have present moment analysis. It's very hard to make some of the changes that you're describing if you're doing post, you know, post quarter Absolutely. analysis. How did you transform or make the journey from this retroactive analysis to sort of real time or present moment analysis? So I, I would say that uh, definitely we're always dealing with lag data. And I think we're probably heavy on the data that lag. Whenever I say lag data, it could be a month, it could be a quarter. Uh, we hit, we even have data that takes six months before we have the data. I mean, you know, we're data rich. It was a lot of me doing downloads of data, getting downloads from our, our data centers, doing downloads and basically spending time with Excel and pivot tables and learning a whole new skill set myself uh, to start really analyzing and diving into this while we didn't have the more sophisticated tools to go in and look at this. Some of where we're at right now and what we're about to, the career is going to actually give us that more real-time insight yeah. into what's going on to where I'm going to I'm going to shorten what I'm probably down to about a week now. I'm probably going to shorten it down to, you know, a day to real time. That's where the industry is really headed. Mm-hmm. So... What are you looking at in the next two years? What do you anticipate? Because you've done this meticulous planning, Mm -hmm. you've gotten the buy-in you have. Once you go, you'll, you, to your point, you'll move with an acceleration and momentum that most other teams don't. What keeps you up at night? What do you think is going to be the first major hurdles? Implementation is going to be the first thing that's going to keep me up at night. As far as kind of like the roadmap though, to the future, uh, that's some of why I'm here at CCW right now is to kind of talk to the vendor, see what see what's in their pipeline, what they're looking at is in the future. For me, I mean, I think Gen AI is going to be part of this, uh, that generative AI. For us and my role, it's always going to be on the on the behind the scenes. It won't be public facing, but it can be behind the scenes on anything from, you know, if it, if I'm using it to help agents, uh, so that they can really focus in on helping the customer. Because what I want my agents to become are advocates for the customer and not just a, a switchboard for, yeah. the, for the customer. You know, we're, we need to compare notes off mic because there are AI companies of various levels of maturity mm-hmm. and transparency and credibility here at the show. Right. So I'd definitely like to help you navigate where the real innovators or honest delivery groups are versus yeah, that'd be great. the hype. Yeah, that'd be great. Because I'm looking at it, even on, even internally in our own sandboxes that are all cordoned off from everything else. Actually, I'm, I'm also looking at it to interpret data of what's going on with those calls and those emails that we get and those different inquiries we're getting. And also uh, along the lines of automated routing to help that customer get where they need to go. So I'm, I'm trying to take it a step further. I haven't necessarily heard the industry talking about some of those things in, in that level of detail yet. So it's going to be kind of exciting as I talk to more to really, really see how much they're really to kind of tip their hand on their their roadmap to the future. So I will tell you that I had a gentleman on the podcast this morning. He's in Texas, mm-hmm. another Texas boy, and uh, he's implementing in a credit union some very interesting multi-touch handoffs right. that I hadn't heard anybody deliver that yet. So that might be a great conversation because I like to connect people who can learn. Oh, that'd be great. So I'll connect the two of you on that. And then... You named a couple of things on AI. Full disclosure, I think two of the three things that you mentioned are sort of still half-baked in the industry. Mm -hmm. But one of them is mature. And I'll I'll make an introduction to uh, a group that is on the pulse of it. It's two years into it. But what I like about them most is they're transparent. Mm -hmm. And they'll let you kick the tires or ask the questions that you need to rather than try to convince you about a story sure that'd be great so <clears throat> let's talk about some of your other um things going on so you're right the implementation is going to be challenging navigating the partners who are really where they say they are you also are in the landscape where no matter where any of us thinks we are we know we weren't ready for chat gpt to no. change everything so we know things will mm-hmm. change rapidly around us my other question is 
how do you philosophically or academically balance or weigh the relationships between the technology and the agents? You know, what's really, I think where we're at, what's really great is we're going to take a, um, a leap. When I say a leap, we're taking like quite a few leaps that I think my agents, the staff that we work with, they're excited about this because to them, this is a modernization project uh, that they've been wanting for a long time. Mm-hmm. Even though it's not a full modernization of our program systems, the overlay and the interface is modern to them, which means they're getting off of green screens yeah. into something that's you know much more enticing and exciting to work in. So they're really excited about it. When this was all announced and I started talking to people, I had some naysayers with this and people that were like, you know, we're, we're not on board with this. But once I started engaging them and I really started engaging the people that were pushing back the most, those people, once they fully understood the vision and saw the potential and everything like that, those were my guys that became my change agents because they were going back and talking to their colleagues. And so I'll give you a great story. When I started this, you know, a couple of years ago, this whole journey, one of the first departments I met with completely resistant to this. I met with them uh, two weeks ago, nothing but head nods and agreement. They're excited and ready for it. So we, we spent a lot of time um, showing to them and demonstrating to them that not only are we going to improve that customer experience, but your experience is going to improve drastically as well. And so I'm not as worried about the change management side of it <laughs> wow. as, as I once was, as I once was. Am, am I still cautiously optimistic about it all? Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, you, we've spoken about the implementation, the change management what do you think, shifting gears a little bit, all of that in the context of a post-COVID world mm-hmm. and a now what I think we see is post-COVID is one thing, but now the world is rapidly becoming bigger and smaller mm-hmm. at the same time. Agents everywhere, technology everywhere. I read a stat the other day that said there's 40,000 technology entrance into the customer experience space worldwide every mm-hmm. year. That's a lot of change. How do you think about your agents and the technology when it's in a global context? Do you would you take any any technology or any agent anywhere or probably for me because some of the bookends I, I mentioned bookends earlier that I have to live within. Uh, for me, I have to have state staff to do the jobs is our is our current interpretation based off of regulations that we have to fall under. So I can't necessarily outsource to that. Although I'm exploring ways to kind of push that a little bit to be able to, to do some outsourcing possibly uh, down the road, or at least be able to have in the event of a hurricane, you know, natural disaster, or pandemic, things like that, where we see call volumes increase, yeah. that if we needed to bring on a, con- a call center, external facing call center, we have the mechanism in place to be able to do that. Sure, resiliency uh, is becoming right. more and more key in yeah. this world. So I, I'm thinking along those lines, um, you know, being, being from Texas, you know, we don't deal with ice storms well. So I do this in my personal life too, you know. So it's kind of the same thing, you know. How can we continue to survive and be operational and all that kind of stuff and be effective with it all, right, uh, from that standpoint. So it's, um, it's operating within the parameters that I have, but how can I be strategic about it? So in this case, you know, it's like get an, umbra, uh, an RF, uh, RFP out, get some con- contact center, BPO type uh, entities in place. And then if I have a need for them, all I got to send to them is a little task order that says, hey, this is what I need. Yeah. Give me the number of agents I need, and then we can ramp them up in less than 30 days. So true. I mean, your planning is so much more proactive, which seems very counterintuitive there. Let's talk about what else is going on. What other influences do you have that shape your philosophy or strategy around CX outside of your context? I grew up in retail. My first job outside of doing construction with the shop teacher in middle school. My first job was working in Sears. I was peddling paint, hardware, lawn tractors, and uh, sporting goods, I think is kind of the, the big items. And uh, I think that is where I learned to listen to the customer. I actually listen to them to understand what their needs are. When I went to work where I'm at now, the guy that hired me said, hey, I need to buy a lawn tractor. You used to sell them. Can you go with me to Sears to pick one out? You know, this was 20 years ago when Sears was still around, sure. right? And um, I said, sure. So we go to Sears and I said, okay, I know what your yard looks like. So we started talking about what, what his needs are. What do you want to be able to do with this? And all that kind of stuff. And I said, okay, 
I'd either get this lawn tractor or that lawn tractor. He's like, why? And so I told him why. And I was, he's like, okay, I'm going to get this one. So he goes over and talks to the cell assistant. This woman walks over to me and says, hey, do you know anything about push mowers and blowers and weed eaters? <laughs> and I said, well, yeah, actually I do. And so I start asking her the same questions. Tell me what your yard is. Tell me what you need. You know, we start talking about everything. And, um, and then another salesperson walks over and uh, to help her. And she goes, well, I want to get this mower, that weed eater, and that blower. He looks at me like, who are you? And I think, I think that job taught me that you've got to listen to the customer. you got to listen to what they're telling you. Not just kind of half-heartedly listen, but the act of listening. Listen to them, understand what their needs are, then help them out where they need to go. I think that's the fundamental part for me. You know, I agree with you. I'm working on a, uh, a little B2B customer experience project myself. And you said something that makes real sense to me, which is every customer or every prospect or ever, every opportunity is different. And the way things are now, we one size just does not fit all. No, it doesn't. And so we need to have more mechanisms to mm-hmm. understand the, the one-to-one relationships. And even then, with all the data and all the stuff we can capture, without a great agent who's empathetic, who can also actively listen as a human, mm-hmm. it becomes challenging. What is your take on AI changing the level of uh, employment with agents? You know, I don't think, I think what's going to happen on that is that we're going to see the role of the agent slightly change and even the skill. You know, I mentioned that I want my agents, my agents to become advocates for the customers, my, 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 my specialty agents, my ombudsmen. I want them to become advocates for the, for the customer. So right now they're, they're operating more like a contact center sort of thing. And they're, you know, they're working through volumes. And then once we get this technology in place, it's going to help streamline some of this stuff. Their role is going to change. And I've even told them, like, your roles are going to change and you're going to become advocates for the customer. We're going to free up some time for you with the customer because we're going to be able to automate some things. But that means you're also going to probably be dealing with customers that have harder, more difficult problems. And I need you all to be able to help them navigate the organization so that we can help them. The other piece that we need to do is because we're siloed right now, is once we overlay this technology across all of our programs, I've got to get people who are siloed that would normally say, oh, that's not me, to now say, you know what, I heard you need to, you need assistance with child care, you need assistance with revenue writing, you need you know, some sort of assistance that they then know and they're empowered to know who to where to route that person to so that the customer doesn't end up in this cycle of having to call us back or call us back or call us back or ha- interact with us in some form uh, that they choose, um, that we're able actually to get them where they need to go and to recognize where to send them. So for us, the technology is going to assist, but my agents are going to have to learn more. They're going to have to know a little bit more. Um, and they're also, they're just going to, the roles are going to change, but it's not going to replace them. Yeah. I'm glad you say that. So many people think that we're going to get a reduction in staff. I will. I will say, I judged a competition recently in the U.S. and they did have a good, strong case study about reduction of staff using technology. I think it's important not to just let that be the end of the story because you may see a reduction in staff in the short mm-hmm. run, but there's no removing the humans from the, not. the process of business. It's not going to remove them. It, it, we're gonna. Through the use of the AI, we're going to take care of repetitive tasks, simple tasks, tasks that are easy to handle, that people were touching a lot of, right? And then we're going to free them up to do other tasks that the AI is not going to be able to do. So that's what's going to happen with it. We're not going to fully replace them anytime soon. And yeah, are we going to, are there going to be some jobs that might get fully replaced by AI? Yes. But there's going to be another job that's going to pop up to replace it. Fair enough. You know, there's this thing called the lump of labor fallacy. And it does that. If you study that at all, it will sort of give you insights that AI or immigrants don't make us lose jobs. And what's interesting about that is 
people, humans tend to think of the technology of AI as both a technological change, but also they view it as an immigration thing right. of a technology. So I know we're, we're, we've, we've taken so much of your time. Before we go, I want to just ask you, um, what's your favorite thing of the show? And have you been to the, how often do you come to the show? So this is my first time at the Las Vegas show. I've been to other CCW events um, that they've done. Uh, I was in the one in Austin uh, back in January and uh, facilitated a, a conversation there at that one. So, and then speaking at this one. So, uh, I try to I try to come as much as I can. Um, this one's uh, this one's you know unique for for me to be able to attend this one. So it's this is exciting. the one. Yeah. So it's pretty exciting because you know here's my opportunity to visit with all the vendors. Uh, and really hit that up. And then also the breakout sessions are great. Oh, yeah. There's yeah. no place better to learn mm -hmm. in one location anywhere in the world. And yeah. I, I I, love this show. But this year, it's, you picked the right year. This is probably the best year in like the last three or four. It's oh, that's amazing. Great. That's great. So, all right. Well, if if uh, because I'm going to publish your podcast, is there anything that you'd like to engage with the community on, things you'd like to learn things that the community can share, um, give back to you for sharing your insights? You know, I'll, I'll take, um, you know, from the community as they, as they listen to our discussion, if they've got any kind of feedback, they're more than happy to, I receive a lot of feedback. I'm okay with it. And they can even tell me if I was good or bad. Um, <laughs> I'll take the feedback and try to get better with it. But also I'll use, I'll use suggestions um, internally as well. Okay, awesome. So, well, Fairless, thank you so much for being on CX in the Wild. And I look forward to watching your journey unfold over the next two years. We're going to have to do a check-in later. Yeah, that'd be great. All right, thank All you right. for being on the show. Thank you.